In Henry James's novel, when the ghost of Miss Jessel appears on the lake, they're sitting on a stone bench and they look over and suddenly the governess, as she's called, sees a woman in black, pale and dreadful, just standing there, actually on the lakeside. When they came to make the movie in 1961, they made a few changes. They had a summer house, a little Gothic folly, looking like a mini temple on the edge of the lake. And they had Flora and Miss Giddens, as she was now known, the governess, talking together. And Miss Giddens looks up, and just behind me, in the reeds by this bridge, there's Miss Jessel sitting there, staring at them in a malevolent way. When you're writing a novel, you can have all these literary tricks where now you see it, now you don't. You, you draw the reader in as to whether they've actually seen a ghost or not. This is, this is obviously the ghost story, classically. But when you're making a movie, you actually see the ghost. So how do you create the ambiguity of whether you've seen them or not? Well, there are all sorts of tricks in the film. The, the ghosts are seen through frosted windows or looking up in a misty tower. Or here, the, the film is degraded, so it looks a bit murky. You're not quite sure that Miss Jessel is in the same register as everybody else. So there's all sorts of distancing effects, but most importantly, you have a shot of Deborah Carr as Miss Giddens looking at the ghosts just before you see them, each time except one at the end. So you see her reaction, then you see the ghosts. Normally it's the other way around. And by seeing that, there's just the possibility that all these ghosts are a figment of her imagination, like Miss Jessel sitting just over there. The director, Jack Clayton, uh, first read The Turn of the Screw by Henry James when he was about 10 years old, and it made a huge emotional impact on him. And it's possible, I mean, some people who are very close to him have said this, that it, there are autobiographical reasons for this. Jack Clayton was born in Brighton. He led a rather nomadic existence as a child. His father was absent. He only spent one term at school in the whole of his childhood. So this theme of the excluded child, the world of the grown-ups and the world of the child, which is central to the turn of the screw, may well have chimed with him. Anyway, when he became a film director, after making Room at the Top, he was determined to adapt the turn of the screw. Huge problem. How do you do that? It's, it's a literary conceit. In fact, Henry James called it an amusette to shock jaded palates. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a slightly facetious attempt to write a ghost story and shock people. Did I see it or didn't I? Clayton started adapting it and found there was a play written by William Archibald called The Innocents, which had opened the Playhouse Theatre in New York in 1950. And the play was owned by 20th Century Fox. And that was Fox's way of holding the copyright of The Turn of the Screw. So the first port of call in adapting The Turn of the Screw was William Archibald. The play was set entirely in the drawing room of Bly House, and it was basically a four-hander. Governess, Mrs. Gross, two rather irritating children. But crucially in the play, it's absolutely clear that the ghosts exist. Uh, at one point, Miss Jessel puts out her hand and holds the hand of little Flora and Miles, towards the end, actually communicates with Quint. So there's a reality to the ghost, and it's a kind of shock horror play with a barnstorming performance at its centre of the governess, who was called Miss Giddens in the play. So Clayton worked with Archibald for a month, adapting the play into a screenplay. But he found that it was rather static, a three-act kind of performance, and it hadn't broken out. And crucially, there was no filmic equivalent of the wonderful, rich, overripe prose of Henry James. You, you had to have some visuals or something that was the, the kind of metaphorical equivalent of, of that kind of writing. But also, you had to alter the pace. It's rather a monotonous pace in The Innocents. But Clayton loved the title. He loved the title because it implies that everyone in the film is, in fact, an innocent. So having worked for a month with William Archibald, uh, then Jack Clayton contacted various friends and acquaintances of his, including Harold Pinter, who gave him some advice on how to adapt it in a filmic way. Crucially, Harold Pinter said, avoid flashbacks. The original idea was to have flashbacks of Quint and Miss Jessel and their life before the story begins. Don't have flashbacks, said Pinter, because no one will believe in the ghosts if you do. So the second writer was John Mortimer, who was brought in for three weeks to Victorianise it, to make the language sound more convincingly 19th century. And uh, he remembers, even now, uh, one or two lines, uh, treating uh, the bedrooms in daylight as if they were dark woods. You know, wonderfully Victorian phrase about how sex is dirty, you know, the dark woods. Uh, absolutely wonderful Henry James-style writing. Um, and also, uh, John Mortimer invented a scene to bring the uncle back halfway through the film to watch a cricket match, to go to the nearby village, to go to a pub, 
And Miss Giddens was, was trying to say to the uncle, you know, I've got something to talk to you about. You know, I've seen these strange apparitions and why was Miles expelled from school? Rightly, I think, they cut that sequence before they filmed it because it introduces a world outside Bly House. The third writer who came on the scene and the main writer, Jack Clayton, said that he was responsible for 90% of the screenplay as filmed, was Truman Capote. Jack Clayton knew Truman Capote. He'd worked with him when Clayton was associate producer on Beat the Devil for John Houston, which was written by Capote on the run as they made the movie. They got to know each other. So it was Jack Clayton that contacted Capote and asked if he'd be interested in turning the play, The Innocents, into a proper movie. The film Capote suggests that when Truman Capote got the idea for In Cold Blood and read about this dreadful murder and got to know the murderers, it became an obsession with him such that he didn't do anything else. It took over his life. Well, actually, a year into his research on In Cold Blood, he wrote The Innocents, the screenplay, in Switzerland and sent it in drafts in, in late 1960 to Jack Clayton. And he was responsible for the bulk of the screenplay. What did he bring to it? Well, he found a visual equivalent for the richness of Henry James's prose. You know, if you're going to strip the story down, as William Archibald had done in his play, you've got to put back something that feels like that rich prose. And what he put back was all that crumbling house, worm in the bud, rotting roses, sculptures with beetles coming out of their mouths, uh, the sculpture garden, the whole feeling of a kind of decadent mansion, the skull beneath the skin, all of that came from Truman Capote, a kind of southern Gothic sensibility superimposed on Henry James. But he also sharpened up the dialogue and made it much more Freudian. Oh, look, the lovely spider, and it's eating a butterfly. Jack Clayton had read a famous essay by the literary critic Edmund Wilson, written in the mid-30s, called The Ambiguity of Henry James, which suggested that the story might well be uh, a, a fantasy on the part of the governess, a sexual fantasy that she's projecting onto the children with a riot of phallic symbols. And Edmund Wilson made also some slightly sort of crude Freudian suppositions about this, that basically it's an early version of a kind of projection story, it's not a ghost story at all. Jack Clayton was very taken with this, but he didn't want it to dominate the film. He wanted ambiguity to be throughout, so the audience wouldn't quite know whether this is a story of a frustrated governess or whether it's a real ghost story. And that ambiguity and the weaving of the Freudian theme into the screenplay were the responsibility of Truman Capote. And it really is a remarkable piece of screenwriting. We lay, my love and I, beneath a This is the spot, the exact spot, in Sheffield Park in East Sussex, where Deborah Carr, as the governess, first meets little Flora, the angelic little Flora, for the first time. And Flora's first words to Deborah Carr on this bridge are, are you afraid of reptiles? It's a good question, actually, because in the story by Henry James, uh, the governess expects Bly House to be a gloomy Gothic pile with creepers, like one of the houses she's read about in the Gothic novels that she enjoys. And she's pleasantly surprised when she arrives that it's bathed in sunlight, it looks joyous, it's a heaven for children, it's a paradise. And the whole thing about this garden and the way it's used in the film is there are a lot of reptiles. First of all, there's Rupert the tortoise, who's introduced into the story by Truman Capote, and then there's the beetle coming out of the mouth of the statue. Statuary, the film is full of it. Cherubs and dryads and military statues in a ring, just as there are paintings of various descriptions on the interior which aren't really in the house. A tapestry of uh, a young lady being assailed by griffins, innocence unprotected, or a painting of motherhood, a mother and child in the background in a lot of sequences. Is it a mother and child or is it something a little bit more sinister? Because by then in the film, we're beginning to see all sorts of sinister things in the most innocent of relationships. Jack Clayton sent out his location hunters in, uh, towards the end of 1960 to find the ideal location for Bly, this place that seems gothic in the mind, but actually is a sunlit paradise when you get here, but which can come to seem more and more sinister. And eventually, he saw an article about Sheffield Park in a travel magazine. It was a house built in the 1770s by the architect James Wyatt in the Gothic Revival style. So you've got turrets and pointed windows and gothic -y effects on the outside. It's actually quite an early Gothic Revival house. Interestingly, the interior of this house is classical, very straight up and down, very geometric, lots of pillars. But the interior of the house in the film was constructed at Shepperton Studios. And what they did was make an interior that looks like this exterior. It was Pugin Gothic, these arched windows, a, a round skylight, and uh, lots of dark panelling, 
the feeling of living in a vast vicarage with 27 bedrooms. So that was all done at the studio. And they were shooting the film in January through to April of 1961. The story by Henry James is set in June and takes you through to the autumn. And you get this sense of the bright sunlight, the sultriness, the closeness of the weather at the beginning of the story through to the, the, the withered wreaths of flowers and dead leaves that you get towards the end of the story as autumn comes along. But uh, it was supposed to be set in June, but they made it in January. So they had to bring with them rose bushes. Roses are really important in this film. The uncle at the beginning wears a white rose in his buttonhole. There's rose bushes everywhere in the garden. The first thing that Deborah Carr does when she goes into the house at Bly is to look at a bowl of roses and one of the petals falls off. Everything looks beautiful, but it's decaying. And in fact, there's a whole series of dissolves in the film which are punctuated by a shot of a vase of roses in between them. So white roses were brought with them. Uh, what they'd have had in the summer here would have been rhododendrons and azaleas, which is what this garden's famous for, and lots and lots of greenery. But most of the flora and fauna was actually brought with them. In fact, there's a shot of poplar trees pointing upwards in the film when Miles races his horse, and I don't think the poplar trees are in this garden as well. So it's a wonderful garden laid out by Capability Brown and Humphrey Repton in the 18th century with different plateaus and different lakes and so on. Uh, it's, it's a classic of garden design, but they had to make it look like the Garden of Bly, or rather the Garden of Bly as depicted by Truman Capote, with the worm in the bud, the reptile in the garden, the shattered Eden. When the governess arrives on this bridge, there's a huge kind of incongruity at lots of different levels. She's a vicar's daughter. She's never left home before. She lives, we learn, in a very cramped house with lots of brothers and sisters, so she's never seen a house or gardens on this scale before. Uh, she's been living in rural Hampshire, and she's been rather sheltered from life, but with a very fundamentalist view of things, good and evil. And that's all symbolised as she walks across this bridge in a big bustle skirt with a crinoline and a tailored jacket with cord decoration on it. And it's, it's slightly incongruous. It's like a piece of haute couture, almost, a kind of fashion plate of the period. As the story progresses, Deborah Carr's costumes change as well. She has about five wonderful outfits that you could argue are a little bit too affluent for someone who comes from a rural vicarage, but never mind, they look wonderful. Uh, I guess it's something to do with The King and I, which was made in 1956, where she also wore bustle skirts and played a governess. Maybe there was a reprise of that. But as the film goes on, she dresses more and more in black, in black velvet, until towards the end, in the last third of the film, she comes more and more to resemble Miss Jessel, as Miles, the little boy, comes more and more to resemble Quint. I'll protect you. And they get locked into this slightly sadistic, slightly pathological, slightly paedophilic <laughs> relationship that in some ways is even more scary today when you watch the film than when it first came out in 1961. But Deborah Carr always reckoned that this was the best performance of her life and in a way she hadn't had uh, due recognition of that. This film showed that she was a remarkable screen actress. Maybe a little old for the part, because in, in, the, in the story she's meant to be 20, but that's fine. It works with the story. In fact, it makes the sexual frustration of the character uh, even more real in some respects. And then there's the relationship with the children. The key to this film was getting Flora and Miles right. Flora, the flower, you know, in context in this garden. Miles, Miles, the soldier, who's always associated with military sculptures. And Jack Clayton was rather despairing. He auditioned about 100 youngsters. And then eventually, he came across Pamela Franklin, who'd never appeared in a film before, and she plays the eight-year-old Flora with remarkable self-possession. And the boy is played by Martin Stevens, who remarkably, although he was 11 or 12 at the time, had already appeared in several films. He'd appeared in The Hellfire Club, uh, and he'd appeared in Village of the Damned, the adaptation of John Wyndham's story, The Midwich Cuckoos, which is all about these incredibly precocious children with blonde hair who've been touched by some alien force and are super intelligent. And that creepy quality to Martin Stevens, he's a grown-up, but he's only 10 or 11. And that quality in his face and his demeanour was absolutely right for the film. And Deborah Carr's relationship with the children was, was remarkable too because Clayton didn't want to introduce the children to the rather darker themes of the film, so he never showed them the script. But having done the adaptation to the screenplay and the casting and the choice of location here at Sheffield Park, the big, big dilemma was how on earth do you visualise something 
that is really an exercise in style, an exercise in ornate prose. Enter the cinematographer Freddie Francis, who'd in fact worked with Jack Clayton on Room at the Top, had shot Sons and Lovers, for which he'd won an Oscar, also in Cinemascope, and had worked on Moulin Rouge and Beat the Devil, on which Jack Clayton was associate producer, so they knew each other. Scope, black and white. The first thing to say about the way this film is shot is that the edges of the screen, particularly in the interiors, are always kept fuzzy. Uh, filters were specially made, according to Freddie, by two elderly ladies who were very good at this, for the edges of the frame, so you get a kind of tunnel of light down the middle of the cinemascope image, usually with Deborah Carr wandering around the corridor. In fact, sometimes it really was a tunnel, because Freddie actually painted the lens in order to make the edges invisible. And the ghosts themselves, of course, in this film, appear at the corner of the retina. It isn't an in-your-face sort of movie, it's a corner of the retina kind of movie. And then some of the tricks of the trade. When Deborah Carr's wandering around the corridors with her candle, they had four wick candles, quick burning candles. So you got that big, big flickery flame. That was the plus, it looks great. The minus is that if you do several takes, then the candle, in fact, burns down very, very quickly. It's very difficult to match shots. And then the famous shot looking up at the tower. Uh, the script says, a flight of birds obscures the governess's view. She's looking up and she thinks she's seen this male figure standing there leaning on the turrets. And later, uh, in, when the shot is reprised in a dream sequence, it has the face of Quint. But at this stage, you can't quite see who it is. And a flock of pigeons flies across in slow motion. What actually happened, according to Freddie Francis, when he reminisced about this uh, a while back, is that it was a happy accident. They shot the pigeons, and it was the end of a magazine of film. And the last few frames speeded up as they went through the magazine. So when they played them back at editing stage, they'd slowed down, and they thought, that looks pretty good, and it does look pretty good, to the point where William Wyler, when he saw the preview, said, Jack, if you can make pigeons act like that, just imagine what you can do with actors. One of the things the Cinemascope letterbox image was famous for at that time was for flattening the image, everyone looking as if they're in the same plane. And Jack Clayton very much wanted for this film figure in foreground, in close-up, and in the depth of field, the children, or Mrs. Gross, or whatever it was, the person that the governess was talking to. So you had to have depth. And in order to get depth, they had to put a huge amount of light into the center of the image. In fact, at one point, Freddie Francis remembers putting 50 brute lights on, which was virtually all the lights of Shepperton Studios, all onto the center of the image. One morning, as a gesture about this, Deborah Carr arrived wearing dark glasses, sunglasses, because it was like working in the Mediterranean. Um, the interior of the house, shot in Cinemascope, has all sorts of film references. The billowing curtains from La Bella La Bette, there's a bit of Citizen Kane there, there's a bit of Vertigo when they go up into the town. And in a way, Vertigo by Hitchcock is a kind of ghost story as well. So there's a kind of cinematic web of references for the interior, as well as taking from the story of Henry James. Freddie Francis' cinematography and this southern Gothic screenplay and the performances and this location and the claustrophobia of the interiors all created a very intense, concentrated world for the story of the turn of the screw. And while they were in post-production, they began to think that the way the film was originally to begin and end rather spoiled that. Because in the script, film begins in a churchyard with uh, the governess, Miss Giddens, standing there and little Miles is being buried. And there's the vicar, there's the uncle, and there's Mrs. Gross, and they're all shunning her and turning their back on it. And she's left by herself, standing in the rain by the graveside. And she walks mournfully back to the house and starts writing a letter to the uncle. And we dissolve to the interview with the uncle in Harley Street, which sets the whole story going. And this opened it out into the church, the congregation, the vicar, everyone standing in the churchyard. It didn't seem quite right. It also made the whole thing a flashback, which was a little bit literal. So what they decided to do was to begin in an extremely enig enigmatic way, that you have a blank screen, you get the song, which we'll learn is sung by Flora and is associated with Miss Jessel, O Willow Whaley, and then these hands come up as if in prayer, but they're not in prayer, and the voice of Deborah Carr saying, all I wanted to do was to save the children. We hear bird song, which is very strange because it's clearly at night, and it also means it's not in church, it's in the open air, 
And the song, uniquely for 20th Century Fox at the time, actually takes over from the great fanfare at the beginning. Go, it's none of that. You get a monochrome image of the logo of 20th Century Fox and Oh Willow Whaley. It's the most eerie kind of effect. So that's how the film begins. You're thinking, is this at the end? Is it at the beginning? Why is she praying? Is it in the present tense? Is it in the past? Who is this woman who's praying? And then at the end of the movie, in the final sequence, they've come out of the conservatory into the ring of sculptures in the garden. And there's the governess with the lifeless body of Miles on her lap. She bends down, kisses him full on the lips with an adult kiss, a reprise of a moment that's occurred in Miles's bedroom earlier. Very, very shocking. And then she puts her hands together as if in prayer and starts speaking the words that we see at the beginning. Has it been a flashback and the whole thing has been in the governess's mind? Is the beginning a reprise of the end? Is the story circular? It's all left up to the viewer to decide, which is one of the enigmas. The Innocents opened at the end of 1961 in London and then in the United States. In fact, I saw it in December 1961. I was much too young and it scared the pants off me. I still haven't quite got it out of my head. But the producers didn't quite know how to market it. The traditional way of marketing a horror movie was schlock. And in fact, on the poster it had, do they ever return to possess the living? A strange new experience in shock. And a photo of Deborah Carr in profile that looks very like the photo of Janet Leigh on the poster of Psycho, which had come out in 1960. So that's the kind of drive-in element. But they were also very keen to show this was an adult experience. Uh, and in fact, this ambiguity was picked up by the critics as well. The art critics thought there was too much thunder and billowing curtains and hammer film type effects in it. And the hammer people thought it wasn't gory enough. So it slightly fell between two stools from the critical point of view, which is where it remained really until about 10 years ago. And it started developing this huge reputation, which, which it enjoys today. The tradition of filming ghost stories in Hollywood was on the whole much more to do with giggles than with gasps, with comedy. The Cat and the Canary in the 1920s, The Old Dark House in the 1930s, The Ghost Goes West, Abbott and Costello. Every comedy turner had a crack at the haunted house shower. And in fact, in 1958, The House on Haunted Hill with Vincent Price was an all-out exploitation movie which promised a skeleton jumping out from the screen and into the laps of the audience. This is shot in Imergo. So that's the kind of comedy version of ghost stories. So you can see why they had a problem marketing. Haunted house stories were for a laugh, but there was another tradition of haunted house movies that it was much more important to associate the innocents with. Jack Clayton was at pains to point out that this movie had nothing to do with Hammer films, because that was another context for the release of this film. 1957, The Curse of Frankenstein with Christopher Lee. Uh, 1958, The Christopher Lee Dracula. And the commercial success of Hammer, uh, which had been taken everybody by surprise for relatively low budget pictures. Psycho 1960, House on Haunted Hill, Fall of the House of Usher must all be contributory reasons why 20th Century Fox agreed to put up a million dollars as the budget for The Innocents. It doesn't sound a huge amount today, but it's a, it's a fair amount of money for a black and white ghost story which they weren't quite sure how to market. But I think the best epitaph on The Innocents is a story that Jack Clayton used to tell and is still told by his widow, Haya Harareet where she remembers eating in an Italian restaurant in Soho in London. And at another table was Francois Truffaut. And the innocents had just come out. And Truffaut wrote a message and got it handed over to Jack Clayton at the table. And on the message it said, The Innocence is the best British film since Alfred Hitchcock left for America. That is, the best British film since The Lady Vanishes. Rather an appropriate parallel when you think about it. The Lady Vanishes, which I think is a very suitable way to end on The Innocence. <laughs>